Nah, I'm tired of playing my favorite tabletop RPGs as one of the old boring races. I don't want those generic store brand backstories. I want to roll a character with a bit more <laughs> character. Well, Roll for Combat is here to help with their incredible new book, Battle Zoo Ancestries Classic Creatures, which gives you the power to create the character of your dreams. Dig into 12 unique playable monster races in this beautifully printed, massive, hard cover book filled with in-depth descriptions, abilities, lore, and more. Send that dusty old dwarf right back to the mines and live out your isekai fantasy by becoming an actual intelligent weapon that you wield yourself. Or you could let a friend grab you instead. <laughs> Teamwork. Put that elf back on the shelf and become a sentient dungeon, complete with traps, treasures, and a living avatar. You could even put an end to the age of man and become a shape-shifting mimic. Y you know, those things that gave you trust issues ever since you were eaten by one in Dark Souls? No, oh, that could be you. Click the link below or head on over to BattleZoo.com to secure your copy of BattleZoo Ancestry's classic creatures today and become the life of your adventuring party. Hello, people of planet Earth. It is I, Stephen Glicker, and Mark Seifter. And who do Hello. we have coming from Canada who is sending us really cold weather? How stop it. It's really cold down here. <laughs> Greg, Greg Gillespie from OSR Publishing, the master of mega dungeons. It's like everyone does something. And you are like, are you like the Mega Dungeon dude? Is that like what you're known for? I suppose so at this point. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan. And I, I, I've i watched the show for a long time, tuned in for all the great news and analysis, and I'm happy to actually be on with you today. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, we met at a convention last month with Professor Dungeon Master and you and me, mm -hmm. and uh, Knights of the Amber Die were there, and... Uh, it was a small but very fun convention for only a thousand people, and mm -hmm. uh, and the auction because they have these like, like they have these like silent auctions or no sorry the flea market that was fantastic the flea market I bought so many modules at that flea market and so much D and D stuff from like first edition so uh, those of you who think not to go to a very tiny convention go to those conventions especially if they have a flea market because. People were just like you could negotiate. There was stuff in good condition. There was, there was a ton there, like really good stuff, stuff that you would find at Gen Con for ten times the price. You know, so I was like very happy with that. In fact, I ran out of money. That's how much I bought. So, <laughs> so you, we're gonna get into news in a second, but you have written some mega dungeons one of the most popular is borrow borrow maze which i've had this is my personal version that i've had for a long time when you still had labyrinth lord and i was impressed i had a i had a kick about 10 years ago where i was buying every mega dungeon i can find and reading mm -hmm. them so uh you were one of the first ones now we, now you have i have the i have the mount here oh i'll go through these we've got four mega dungeons look at this this is enough <laughs> this is what this is when I go to the retirement home. That's what I'm going to bring with me. Uh, but you have the brand new Dragon Slayer book, which just came out. Tell me a little yeah. bit about that because I saw it and it looks awesome. Yeah. So <clears throat> effectively, uh, the short version of the story is this is the rule set that I've been using with my home game. It's uh, how we played in the nineteen early nineteen eighties and. Uh, I've been working on it um, for a few years, just sort of like putting all my notes together. And then uh, the year before the whole, you broke the whole old GL um, stuff mm -hmm. last winter, uh, I was working on it. And then I really decided that, okay, we're, this is going to be an interesting new world we're going to be moving into. And I need to put the pedal down and then also uh, to, to get it out. And then also in terms of thinking about the uh, 50th anniversary of the game, I thought that was also an appropriate time. So I really started uh, getting after it. And uh, and then so it came out just last week and it's doing terrific. And I'm very pleased with it. It has a cover art by, uh, by Jeff Easley, who uh, those of you out there might remember from the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons um, um, Dungeon Master's Guide and many, many others. 
So it was really great to work with him. I had to sort of like uh, gently prod him with my polite Canadian emails every once in a while for about a year and a half. And eventually he caved and um, agreed to, to do a piece for me. Uh, and then I also worked with uh, Darlene, who did the um, original Greyhawk maps. Uh, so that was pretty exciting. And then a few others. So it's really, it's been a, a treat. Uh, I have a very clear vision in my mind for the aesthetic of what I'm looking for and how that integrates into the mechanics. And and here we are. So this uh, Dragon Slayer can come out and it can be part of the marketplace of ideas relative to uh, role-playing games and and uh, the third-party license for those that want to create modules or create supplements or whatever. And, and we'll see where we go from here. I'm very excited. And the feedback has been very positive so far. We'll get into that in the second half, but one of the things I noticed, Mark, is that you know how critical I am of layouts. Um, it's that I, I think I won't get into it, but I think most layouts are very poor. Not poor. I think a lot of D and D, a lot of book layouts are okay. Okay, I think they're fine. I don't think they're functional. they're functional. They're okay. But I saw his, and immediately I was like, and all your books. Like you could tell the designer's eye because you do little things like use the art style, uh, which is exactly the same art style for the same creature from the uh, advanced D and D books from the first edition books. And then you do something very interesting, which I'm not gutsy enough to do, is that you actually seem to lay out your text and then put in art to fill in the space. So you have no white space in your book mark you think we don't have any white space he has even less than we do because every piece of white space he fills with art because he has a custom made for that space I, I i have to do it the other way i actually have to fit it it's more like a puzzle when i do it but you uh, every inch of this book is like covered with art which is amazing so well, oh, thanks. I really appreciate that. I think that's that's the kind of polish that uh, RPGs deserve. And as you pointed out, sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't. But you know, that, I think we're shooting for the same kind of things, and we appreciate the same kind of uh, aesthetic when it comes to layout. Yeah. Well, it's just RPG books are very hard to lay out, and you either you have to know the industry, and you have to know like what you can and can't divide like you can't you know it's like don't try not to split a feed across multiple pages so you have to fit the stats for a monster a certain way like you know these are all these little rules you need to learn and the problem is is that people who are good at design aren't necessarily good at rpg design so i've i've had issues and and so in the end i end up doing my own design and layout <laughs> you're 100 correct yeah just because somebody is creative and can come as an idea person mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean they can operationalize that and then and then have that in a functional layout that works on paper to minimize page flipping yeah yeah exactly right and you when i met you and i saw it i knew right i was like that's i think the first thing i said i was like yeah this is an a plus layout it's like very very strong layout uh which i liked a lot but thank you with that don't forget, like and subscribe. Yeah, like so and subscribe. All that YouTube jazz. But before we do anything, I am going to get into the new, mini topics. The mini topic news of the week. We have so many. There's so for, a bunch. So for the last couple of weeks, nothing. <laughs> it was dead quiet. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, <laughs> well, it all's related. I'll start with the first topic, which actually is all these other topics actually branch off the main topic, which is Hasbro had their corporate earnings last uh, yesterday. Um, and that's why, like all this news came out because it was going to come out one way or the other when they did their corporate earnings report. So that's why a lot of news came out earlier in the week or late last week or yesterday, because this was all coming out. And, you know, so they, they put in their quarterly earnings for Q4, which is usually supposed to be your good one. Because that's, you know, Christmas, that's October, November, December, and they lost $1.06 billion, not for the year, for three months. In three months, they lost $1.06 billion. Um, you could spend that however you want. It's not good, <laughs> especially considering the entire company is only worth about $5 billion. They lost... 20% of their company in, in one quarter. And if you put in the sale of E1, they're actually 
lost somewhere around $1.9 billion, if you include E1. Uh, oh, I thought it said that they included certain mm -hmm. aspects of E1 um, that were like goodwill and something. If they that do was the goodwill, to... yeah, it's a 1.9. And that's basically to write off taxes. Like, the, the good, news is, uh, good news is they're not going to owe any taxes this year because they lost so much money, they have nothing to tax. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is... Yeah, for the full year, they lost $1.5 billion. Last year, they had a $204 million profit. And this is actually a 15% decline. Uh, so they've been declining, I think, something like three years in a row. And they're declining by, like, double digits. They're not declining by 1% or 2%. They're declining by, like, 15 10 15 20%. Now, here's the thing. It's that... It's not their fault. And I've mentioned this in many of my streams, and we've mentioned it on here. And kids just don't play games like they used to anymore. I mean, I have kids, and I am much more tapped into the industry because this is what I do for a living. And I've said it before, and people always get in the comments, my kids play games, my kids play board games, my kids play Lego. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm not saying all kids, but... If you look at the industry, <laughs> and the industry continues to go down every single year, and they're the market leaders, they're literally ranked number one in all these categories, I hate to break it to you, that you can have every one of your friends and every single one of your kids and every single one of your kids' friends playing games, that doesn't mean that's where the industry is going. And the industry is going that kids play computer games, they play with their iPhones, they play with their iPads, and that's it. And that's kind of where they're all going. And the days of like dolls and toys, it still exists, but it's decreasing every single year. And I don't see how it's really going to, it's going to bottom out and stop, but that's where they make a lot of their money. So I really don't know what to do here. Um, do you guys have any comments on this? I mean, I, I can talk about this for hours, so I don't want to get all into this. I think you know <laughs> the most, you understand the most what it means with yeah. some of the jargon they used okay. in Chris Cox's call to the investors <clears throat> about why and how the money was lost. And I don't want to overly comment on that when I don't, Fully I don't understand. have That's the fine. business know how. It, it obviously it looks bad. It looks bad. Right? Yeah. It looks bad to me as a, don't understand investor calls and what what it means to have lost it in that certain ways but i think your analysis is going to be more informed yeah basically they they met they're doing a lot of write-offs i mean what happens is when you start losing money what you'll often do is that you'll just say well let's just go all in and they'll usually start just dumping as much money and as much losses and pile them in to a couple of quarters as much as possible because why would you want to have a good quarter and then put losses in there to bring that quarter down so what they'll do is they're like look we're already losing a ton so let's just put everything in there let's just like take every single thing we could possibly find and throw it into a single quarter and just bite the bullet instead of like having pain over several quarters. So this is not uncommon. Okay, that's the first. Well, thing. They're they're making to Hasbro's making toys for movies that don't sell. Exactly. That's and that's the other problem. If, let's just be honest about it. Um, young girls don't tend to buy action figures in the same manner that young boys do. Now, young boys aren't buying action figures in the manner that they used to in previous generations either. That's quite true. But generally speaking, girls don't buy a lot of action figures. So what happens is Hasbro makes these action figures for these movies that don't make money. Then the action figures don't sell and then they get sold off and you can find them at Ollie's for a couple of dollars. So they need to rethink. Um, kids aren't playing with toys. You're quite right. So what are you going to do? And certainly supporting films that aren't playing to their target audience doesn't help them either, I don't think. I yes. don't think it necessarily has to do with like the gender distribution of who's buying the toys. It's just the, the generational. I think I remember Young Justice, which was just an amazing TV show that got canceled because it wasn't moving toys enough. It wasn't moving the figures. And if I remember correctly on the um, statistics on that, actually girls were buying it more than boys and they weren't expecting that because a lot of the toys they thought were targeted one way or the other. 
but it also wasn't hitting their market demographic of particular ages and some of the toys. It eventually came back on like a WB streaming or something like that. So I think it's more generational and that they're they're that people across genders are using are buying toys less of those types you're i agree with you i agree i think it's both, it uh, is both. so can, you can we always can we point to outliers where hey this show did sell toys to boys and girls and great and that's awesome but speaking more broadly i think that might be a different story but at the end of the day i think it's both for... no no it's totally both because they and i didn't even get into this hasbro was putting out toys for disney movies um Disney is probably doing worse than Hasbro right now. I mean, yeah. Disney's in even more trouble. And I was like, wow, if you tied your if you tied your horse to, you know, that that was a bad bet. And they're both going down together. Uh, because the the movies did this was one of the worst years ever for Disney in history for their movies. And if you have movies and toys tied to movies that no one sees, then no one's buying the toys. And that's always been an issue though. Like, this is this is nothing new. Okay. This has happened even back in the 80s like when he-man was selling gangbusters and they were trying to rush a movie into production and it took so long for the movie to come out by the time the movie came out he-man wasn't selling anymore you know it just mm -hmm. took too long so but in terms of like both boys and girls buying things i can point to one that's not even an outlier uh, a little thing called harry potter and as much issues as harry potter has as many men and as many boys and as many girls buy Harry Potter, it's very even distribution, and that thing sells endlessly and still does. Uh, it it just it just makes money. I have I have I know for a fact that I have a lot of friends who have stores and they're always like that thing. This is, like Star Wars did not sell. Pretty much nothing sold. Harry Potter always sells. It still sells. It always sells. And because of the market and it's a book that you read. When you're a kid and it's still selling that you have a built-in market which is kind of what disney was doing that you always have these new people coming in reading harry mm -hmm. potter buying the toys they grow up and then the new kids come in so they always have a new perpetually generating market for those toys um mm -hmm. and they're not the only ones i mean winnie the pooh you know uh any traditional disney toy mm -hmm. you know like the like that's what disney does that's why disney made so much money the problem yeah, is they've they got the generational sort of just right. parents show it to their kids right. and then that continues going. Right. And Hasbro just doesn't have, you know, they had some toys like, you know, Transformers and uh, Peppa Pig and Mr. Potato Head. Supposedly Play-Doh's doing really well. I mean, look, they're still selling, okay? It's not like they went to zero. But what they're really struggling with is the toy market of uh, action figures and mm -hmm. you know they're probably going to get rid of that they're going to concentrate more on things like learning toys which actually always do well because kids i used to work for nickelodeon uh and 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 uh, also worked with um harry potter and one thing i learned when i worked at nickelodeon and i did like timon and pumbaa and i did little bill and uh and uh, blues clues i did all their uh, uh websites and uh video games is that parents will spend any amount of money on something if they think it's educational <laughs> for their kids they'll spend a lot so what you do is they're probably going to pivot to that which is the better market anyhow or, you know go to play-doh go to the younger segments which they'll be able to make money on forever and they don't have to worry about it and then they're probably going to go heavy into digital because digital is like the profit margins on digital are disgusting i mean you might make one two three percent on a on an action figure uh you can make 40 percent on a digital product so the other the other part too is not just the figures that you're choosing to make but the quality of the figures yes. so we've all probably seen examples where you know someone's got a you know the uh the dungeon dragons cartoon figures that were released in the last little while and you try to put something in the hand the hand breaks and you know, we're not talking kung fu grip here for uh, for gi joe so if the quality of the things you're making it uh, is known to be brittle then that raises another issue and won't, won't get people flocking to your product yeah i mean it's really a it's all hand in hand though because what they try to do is like well we'll sell this product and we'll make it less quality because people will buy it, but then they don't buy it because it's less quality and it becomes this like chicken and egg thing. And before mm -hmm. you know it, it's like, like, 
you know, they're thinking, oh, people aren't buying it because they don't want the product. It's like, no, they're not buying it because the quality is poor. And that's right. You know, so, but then if they raise the quality, they have to raise the price and then people might not buy it. So it's a lose lose situation. Anyhow, they lost a lot of money. They sure did. Uh, that does worry me about the next article, which is they did announce when all the D&D books are coming out. And what's fascinating is that if you remember during PAX Unplugged, there was a leak and they said that the player's handbook was supposed to come out on May 21st and I of Vecna was supposed to come out on May 21st. And then you had an insider who was saying that they were doing enough final steps yes. on the Vecna that it was very clear that Vecna was going to come out in May. And oh, that yeah. was... That was why you were always saying that it's all going to come out in May because yes. the leak was very credible. Yes. Whereas I was saying that that may be true, but like where they were in the play test, it didn't look like they could get the player's handbook out by May Com at all. Completely and, right. You're completely right. And but, you were right about your, your Vecna leak was correct. Oh, yeah. Because Vecna yeah. is coming out on the day that uh, they said, but the player's handbook isn't coming out until much later. September, right? In November yeah, September, for the game, November, Dungeon Master, and yeah. then Monster next Manual. year, the 20. <laughs> they're going to have to rename it from the 2024 <laughs> update if part of it is in 2025, I guess. Well, no, they're not. Well, this is what happened. They have the making of D&D. &D. Uh, that's coming out on June 18th, which was the same date that was leaked. Quest of Infinite Staircase coming out on July 16th, which is the same date that was leaked. So every single leaked date is the same date they announced, by the way. Uh, I am positive that the handbook was supposed to come out. The player's handbook was supposed to come out on May 21st. I'm positive it was. I'm positive it's been pre-printed in significant amounts. They pre-printed the signatures, they pre-printed the covers, they pre-printed a lot of this. I'm positive they have. I wouldn't even be surprised if there was a demo copy of Gamma when I go to Gamma in two weeks. I wouldn't even be surprised. I have a feeling that either A, they definitely wanted a little bit more time, B, which people are saying is that, well, there's AI art in there they need to get rid of. I doubt that one highly because I hate to break it to you, I have Vecna quests and making of D and D. Those were printed last summer, so if there is any AI art, it's too late because those books. And are there's done. like uh -huh. there's that's not why they deleted. No, no that's it's not because of AI art. No, it's. I not mean, you just art. look at where they were at on the play test. You look at where the design cycle was. Yeah, and I even said this. I was saying if they really do put it out, then then in some cases they either would have had to not be actually listening to people's playtests, and they've said that they are, and I believe that they were, or they would have had to lay out some parts of it and left certain parts unlocked and then paid yeah. extra to the printer to change it at the last minute. It's weird. That's why I thought it was it was potentially going to get delayed, um, or they were going to do something weird like that. And so, like, it, kind, it, it makes sense. They needed extra time on these things. May was always a very unusual time to get yeah, all of them out. But look at this. They have all... So they're going to conventions. They're going to GaryCon, going to PAX East. They're going to ALA, San Diego Comic-Con, Gen Con, PAX West, Game Hall, Big Bet. Like, they have an entire con season, which they never list, by the way, because they, they never go to conventions. So they're going to conventions. They have booths at some of these conventions. So what are they going to have? Because I think they were planning on going to these conventions and selling the Player's Handbook and selling these adventures. Because they have everything was coming out May, June, July. I have a feeling they were supposed to come out with everything by Christmas this year and have a box set. And I'm going to tell you a secret why. Because I actually know something. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Is anyone listening? Is it just us chickens? All right. Are you ready? I actually, this is inside dirt that I, that I know. I'm not supposed to tell anyone. But I'm going to tell you. Why are you telling us if you're not supposed to? Eh, because I, I don't follow the rules. I'm a rule breaker. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's it's a, it's a it's an opinion of mine. And I think I might have said this on the Wait, so it's before. not an inside dirt? It's just an opinion? No. I'm just saying that so I don't get in trouble. It's inside dirt, too. <laughs> Informed dirt. It's, uh, it's inside dirt that I believe is 99% true. And I... Uh, I might have mentioned this on the stream before. I think I did, so it's not super. But so there's a thing you have to tell your books. You have to you have to list your books nine to six months ahead of oh, time. Yeah, that's not inside dirt. Every 
Like that's well known thing about the solicitation phase on books. We've talked about it, yeah. That's not what I was getting at. But what's oh. the solicitation phase for a game? Uh it's different, right? It's um it's less than um than a book. Six weeks. Yeah. And if you categorize your product as a game rather than a book, guess what? They can't return it. Games can't be returned. Books are returnable. So if I sell Walmart a thousand books and they only sell a hundred books, they're going to send me back 900 books and that I have to credit them. If I sell them a thousand games, they keep those games forever. What they do with them is not my problem. The other thing is I make a much higher percentage on games than I do on books. On books, you only make about 40, 35, 40%. A game you can make 50 55 even 60 percent on a game so why do you think they've been making these box sets and making uh all these like boxes that are look like games now so what you do is you put your player's handbook your dm's guide and your monster manual into a box set you sell it to these companies in with only six weeks lead time you don't need six months just six weeks as a game as a game category game these I mean, are actually... it is a game so it's not yes. like deceptive no, no that it's, it's completely, a game. Legal. completely illegal in fact i'll tell you why you don't do this okay now we're really getting deep in the weeds if you are selling a book and you bring it from overseas there's no tariffs on books okay so if I bring books, sorry, sorry, no, there's, sorry, wrong. There's no tariffs on games. So games are excluded from tariffs, but books have, I think, like a 15% tariff on them. So if you print a book overseas and then bring it into this country, you have to pay a 15% tariff in the United States, mm -hmm. which just gets passed on to the consumer. But if you categorize your product as a game, and these are actually worldwide categories, like you actually have categories for this, there's no tariff. It's zero. So guess what everyone categorizes all their books as whenever they bring them into the United States from, from China? They're games. Game. Oh, yeah, of course they're games, because they are games. You're not lying. They're books, but they're games, you know. They're actually considered they they're they are games. I mean, they're not like a board game, but they are considered games. So what I think Hasbro's gonna be doing is to make more money, and one of the reasons they got rid of Penguin is that they do have their own game distribution network already in house. They actually already have one. So what they're gonna do is that they're gonna recategorize these as games, sell them in rather than just like loose books they're going to sell them in box sets they'll be able to do it with less lead time they only need six weeks instead of six months and they make a higher percentage of profits and they can't be returned how about that for inside dirt have, you, have i told anyone that yet That's i don't think you've given there. all those details <laughs> so that that's some like crazy inside baseball but i bet you that's what they're gonna do and it's really it not possible. It's not that far fetched. Um, it makes sense to get something out before the holiday season, just anyway. I'm sure right. they would have loved to have all three of them out by then if they could, right. just because people want to buy something for their family member on the holidays. Mm -hmm. And also, if you look at the box of the box of many things, the deck of many things that came in a box. And mm -hmm. I can look it up. I'd be curious. I don't, I bet you that sold as a game and not a book. And again, it's a big deal because if you sell it as a game, it can't be returned and they get a higher profit. They got a much higher profit margin, like much higher profit margin. And considering how many books and how many games that Hasbro sells, if they sell a million copies and they're making an extra 20%, 25%, that's massive. And that's a huge increase in sales. Um, now, the, and the other problem, and the other thing is they can easily do this because Barnes & Nobles have game sections now. Like maybe 10 years ago, this probably wasn't an option. <laughs> did they even have a game section? Maybe, I don't think so. Or at least they did, it wasn't that big. Now you go to Barnes & Noble, there's a huge game section. Anyhow, there's my inside dirt that I think they're gonna, uh, they're gonna do. Don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make a, a mega dungeon in a second. This is just a new segment so I wanted to go through.
Um, yeah, which just a surprisingly large amount of news. Uh, I'll go through two really quick, three really quick ones. First of all, Hasbro so far has made ninety million dollars on Baldur's Gate three. That's a lot for a licensing deal where they don't have to do that much other than license it out and get it set up. They don't have to do anything. <laughs> so they basically, I mean, they help them out during the design and development process. So they help them out over the course of six years. Larian makes the game. And then Larian pays Hasbro every mm -hmm. quarter a couple million dollars. So when that news broke a couple weeks ago that people said, oh, it was fake news that I accidentally spread, that, oh, there's no way that Hasbro is going to be, like, licensing their properties. Uh, a, they already did. <laughs> In fact, they said their two most profitable properties last quarter were Baldur's Gate 3 and Monopoly Go. That's both... different than selling it. But we did say that I, I that could have been... Yeah. Made up based on your video. Yeah, I said licensed, not sell. They said sell, and I, yeah, they could sell it too. They would just sell it for more. Like if they're making ninety million, uh, if, if sorry, if Larian made, if sorry, if if Hasbro made ninety million on Larian, on has uh, Baldur's Gate three. Baldur's Gate three has sold approximately twenty, somewhere between twenty two and twenty five million. We're not exactly sure because I don't have like we only have I only have the PC sale numbers. I don't actually have the um. Uh, the the uh, Xbox and uh, PS5 numbers. We'll say 25 million. It's made 25 million copies. They sell it at 60 bucks a copy. They keep say 40 dollars a copy. What's the math on that, Mark? Say 40 dollars times 25 million. How much money is that? I mean, 40 dollars times 25 million is a billion. Okay, so they've made about a billion dollars on how. We'll say, um, and I think that's accurate. We'll say about a billion dollars in Baldur's Gate three. And they're going to continuously make money forever, okay? If you look at the top games of all time on Steam, in terms of player engagement, uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is now number three. And that is, like, that has more than half a million comments and people engaging with it. This is a game that will basically sell forever, okay? This is one of those perpetual games that people will just buy and play and buy and play for next 10 20 years it's just gonna happen and in fact they just did a huge update there's a huge update coming up this week and larian will never stop updating it so it's always going to be in the news it's always going to be hot people are always going to be buying it and hazard's going to be making money so when they go larian goes and says we want to make baldur's gate 4 do you think hasbro is going to sell it to them for whatever it was probably five ten million dollars plus a percentage of the sales <laughs> No, <laughs> they're going to say uh, we want $250 million in a percentage of the sales and you will make that back in the first day. And they'll probably have to say yes, because they own the property. And that's for the license. That's not even to sell it. That's just to license it for one game. And they'll do it. That's what, and they'll probably sell it for around that because that's about right. So anyhow, I think uh, next mini topic, next <laughs> mini topic. All right. Last but not least, I'll do this one is that D&D &D said in their sales that they were going to model D&D &D after Magic the Gathering's universes beyond pop culture crossovers. Chris, Chris Cox said, D&D uh, &D Beyond is an excellent platform for us to build upon the ways people are playing D&D. &D. And then he wrote, are you ready? Targeted entertainment working through partners in an asset light model. Targeted entertainment working through partners in an asset light model. What does that mean? That means we want to create products from other platforms on our digital platforms because it's acid light. We don't need to actually do anything. Then he gave examples <laughs> that showed that there would be cross-promoted ones. Right. And then also just partnerships with third parties, right. you know, like they're doing now with Ghost Fire, yes. and then their own internal stuff. He yes. gave those as three examples of things they would do. So yes. that and definitely means they could have things like those Magic the Gathering sets that are crossovers with like other universes, but put it in D&D. &D. Yeah. And if you don't believe me, Disney just bought out a part of Fortnite for $1.5 billion so that they can start putting Disney products in Fortnite. 
And the most depressing part about that story is that there's a quote from the CEO who said to the effect, I'm surprised how popular video games are and how many people are playing video games. More people play video games and spend time playing video games than watching Disney+. Plus. I was like, really? It's, is this guy the CEO of Disney? Shouldn't he know this stuff? Why is it I know this stuff and he doesn't? Isn't this like his whole business model? Like... Because <laughs> you fall you fall upwards in that industry. I guess so. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I don't know anything about running theme parks and uh, animation. So, you know. I mean, yeah, I guess that's fair. But yeah. it should be blatantly obvious that games are up in every demographic. People are playing different kinds of games. And yeah, a lot of that money is in mobile games with like weird predatory gotchas and um, loot boxes and all those other things. Mm -hmm. But games are big yeah but the point is is that i think that lord of the rings magic was fantastic it was one of the it was their best-selling game ever they made millions on that hundreds of millions however there's already several uh lord of the rings role-playing games like do we really need another Lord of the Rings D and D game? Like, do we? But if you don't, it won't be in Dungeons and Dragons, Stephen. For some people, they that aren't willing to branch out to another role playing game system, this will be their chance to get Lord of the Rings without branching out to another system. But there's already five E Lord of the Rings game. I'm looking. That at is <laughs> that is true, and I guess with the specific example of Lord of the Rings, they did just get a five E version, so they don't need to do that. They probably won't, right. but. And I know that was their number one best, like Magic the Gathering crossover thing with the One Ring and all that other shenanigans. But um, they they've got to be other crossovers they could do theoretically. Like they could do GI Joe in D and I'm not saying that's like a good know, matchup because it's like stylistically very dissimilar. Yeah, I just don't know if this is going to be the cash grab that people they think. Like when you're buying a physical product, people <clears> like to buy physical products. And I just don't see how you, unless they're going to make it a single player experience, like I've been saying they're going to do and have like the AI dungeon master and have some video game aspect to it, because it's a, it's a tall order to ask a DM to buy GI Joe D and D and then all, and then three or four players to buy it too. That's a lot of buy-in. That's too much buy-in. But if you have, on D and D Beyond and their virtual DTD, a a single player game that you can run on your own in that world with the AI dungeon master. That that's a probably a good sell because you only have to sell it once to one person. You don't have to sell it to five people, right? I don't know. I, all I know is like D and D. No one's figured out how to make a lot of money on D and D yet, and uh, I don't know if that's going to do it. So there you go. And the last mini topic that I saw was that the Dragonlance live action series got canceled. So it wasn't canceled because I don't it know. It wasn't? If, well, I don't know if it would ever start it. So. Oh, okay. That could be the case. But uh, we we have, we have officially know it's not happening though, right? Because yes. didn't uh, Man, Mandiana Niello specifically say it's, it's, it's done? So the rumor is, is that Joe Mangiola, whatever, I can't even pronounce his last name. Manganella. Man Manganella. Okay, Joe Manganella. Thank you. Now I know how to say it forever. Joe Manganella is that he wrote a plot for Dragonlance and that the project never got that far. It was going to be with E1, which was owned by Hasbro at the time, and that it was supposedly very fantastic. It was awesome. It was the best thing ever they had a thousand page lookbook which is a big collection of photos for uh, creative people so they know how to create the armor the weapons the clothing um i promise this is the last topic but i want to talk about this because my brother is a costume designer in hollywood and he did the last ghostbusters movie so i actually know a lot about this topic so i just want to talk about it from my point of view because i've been seeing a lot of people's takes on this and uh everyone's wrong so i'm just telling you right now you're all wrong i'm going to tell you what really happened so this is it. The scripts, Joe, no offense to Joe, and he's like, the script is fantastic. It's one of the best scripts ever. Um, 
I want you all to go out there and get a script of whatever movie you like. Heck, I'd say get a script for a movie that is okay. I'll give you a perfect example. Conan the Destroyer. Not Conan the Barbarian, Conan the Destroyer. Second movie in that franchise. The script for Conan the Destroyer, which I've read, is absolutely incredible. I was, I couldn't put it down. I'm like, this is so freaking good. This is way better than the first movie. The script is 1% of a project, okay? You have so many things when you make a TV series or a movie. My brother who works on these, he always tells me he's amazed does these ever get done. <laughs> it's just like there's hundreds of people working on this thing, all in different departments that all have to come together to make this perfect souffle. And if even one of them goes wrong, you know, you can have something as stupid as they don't have, they don't film on on, color, on uh, film stock anymore. You film on the wrong film stock, and then the color shifts, and then it ruins the picture. You have someone who's sick that day who couldn't show up, and they only have them for a certain amount of time, so they have to rewrite a scene, and that was an important scene. There's so many things that go wrong and can go right on a set. Is that having a fantastic script? I hate to break it to you. Every movie ever made, Hollywood, big budget, they all have fantastic scripts. Every single one of them. That doesn't mean they're going to make good movies. It doesn't mean they're making good TV shows. They often all have really, really good scripts. The other thing is, fantasy will cost, we'll say, 100. It's going to be $150 million. I'll say $100 million. I'll, I'll be generous. This will cost $100 million. So they make this, and they, they spend $100 million to make Dragonlance. How do you make your money back? Does anyone know? I'm just curious. Do you guys actually know? Like, okay, I just made a series. I just spent $100 million. I have a whole series. Now what? Now what do I do with it? You have to, like, sell it to the different streaming services? Correct. So you could sell it to either network TV, you could sell it overseas, or you could sell it to streaming services. Now, that's traditionally, it used to be, you would sell it to network TV, and network TV makes money by running advertisements, the production company makes money because they get a, they get paid for it, plus they get a percentage of the advertising. If they go three seasons or make a hundred episodes, it can become syndicated, and that's where the real money's at. If you become syndicated, you can make hundreds of millions, and that's where you do repeats, and it, it shows on uh, different channels throughout the world. So the goal for anything is to always to become syndicated. That's actually the goal of all <clears> TV shows. In the streaming world, um, I won't get into it, but streaming has basically destroyed the model, so no one gets paid anymore because of the way streaming works, which is why... That's why all the strikes were correct. happening, because it was a yes. big issue. Yes, you're 100% right. And they, they streaming has basically been built to destroy the model so that no one gets paid anymore. Uh, so they spend $100 million on this. They then have to find someone who will pay a hundred million, a hundred fifty, two hundred million, or more to then buy it from them and put it on their streaming service. And Hasbro probably felt like, yeah, I really don't want to spend a hundred million, one hundred fifty million dollars on something that we might not sell and lose all that money. That makes sense for so why they would <laughs> have um, not. It, it canceled is not the right word. Stop moving forward. Whatever the thing that they chose to do of not doing it. Yeah. So I All feel right. I feel bad for him and I feel bad for everyone who wanted this to happen. It but sounded I'm, like he poured a huge amount of like effort and, and passion into it up until that point. No, he, he did. But you know what? And he had like a thousand page thing that had been like vetted by the authors of Dragonlance and other stuff. Yeah, but that that's all standard, okay? None of this yeah. is like that that is my brother always gets a lookbook. Um he often will make the lookbook. Um, and then it'll be used throughout, throughout for like everyone, like the special effects people and the people who do like the, uh, the secondary costumes or do the, uh, set dressing, um, or the costume design. Sorry, the, um, not, he does costume. He doesn't do the pieces, uh, uh jewelry. Like he doesn't do that stuff. So right. that will go. So he'll make the lookbook usually himself. So th none of this is, I feel terrible for Joe. But everyone who's saying, oh, how dare they not make it? It's like, okay, if you have... That seems like a standard thing that could happen. I'm like, if you have $150 million, I'm sure, and you call up Joe and say, Joe, I will produce this for you. Do you want to make it? I bet you will be made. So I'm if sure anyone's out there then. who has that much money and wants to do this, give Joe a call. I bet you it will be made. Until then, 
Uh, don't hold your breath. So Anyhow, how about the mega dungeons? Steven? How about the mega dungeons, Greg? Sorry, I always like to go through the news. That's first. We got plenty of time for <laughs> you. So, Greg, give us a little history of why, where, and how. Why my dungeons? Why mega dungeons? Why dungeons? Why a book of nothing but a dungeon? Not dungeons, a dungeon. Well, <clears throat> so I was uh, playing with my home group, and uh, we would, you know, through chat, uh, going back a long way, we would discuss what we wanted to play on Friday night, and then we'd get there and we'd uh, be all set to play, and whatever they decided on in the group chat that we were going to do during the week, they'd sit down at the table the first five minutes, they'd change their mind, and then now I'm sort of scrambling. And so uh, uh, at the time, uh, things were, you know, um, work was very busy and I was getting frustrated, so I was like, you know, I'm just gonna create sort of like a tent pole mega dungeon that, uh, that where I can do a lot of prep in advance, and then that will just save um, that sort of happening, and I'll, I'll feel more prepared and better to run the game and so on. So that's basically how uh, Barrel Maze started. And um, you know, if I was to if if I was to speak sort of in terms of like a, a meta, what I've done with the various mega dungeons is I'm trying to expand the definition of the traditional mega dungeon. So each has its own take on that theme. And uh, I'm trying to do, um, like with the example of the first uh, three, the prep's really already done. So, you know, people are, have busy lives. Um, DMs have busy lives. They need to be able to sit down and play if they don't have much prep time. And so Dwaro Deep is the one that takes a little bit more, uh, the, the DM needs a little bit more hands-on approach, but the others are ready to roll out of the out of the, uh, out of the cover. So that's a little bit of background, and I can expand on that as you like. But what makes a mega dungeon uh, to you, and I did an episode on, on my channel about mega dungeons recently, so I've been thinking about this, what makes it different than just a dungeon that happens to be kind of long? Sure, well... So I'm a little bit different in my uh, in my feeling about mega dungeons. I think all dungeons need to be completable. There needs to be a realistic chance to complete it. Now I'm not saying you're going to complete it with the first character you roll up. That's highly unlikely. However, if you stick to it and you stick it out, it should be completable. So having said that, I don't see like this big. You know, there's different ways of thinking about it. Like, um, you know, uh, it's not. Like a labyrinth kind of has a center to it, but a, a maze doesn't. And and there should be, you know, um, minor objectives along the way. And now, having said that, uh, in in my mega dungeons, I don't have a very I'm, I'm not coming top down with a very heavy plot or storyline that I'm forcing the players through. I think of it not in different terms. Um, play doesn't precede. Excuse me. Story doesn't precede play. Rather, play emerges or story emerges from play at the table. So story doesn't precede play. Yeah, there might be a meta, but having said that, the story of the game emerges from play at the table as the just like when we write when we roll up a character, we have some stats on a page and we might have a name, we might have a little bit of a backstory. But how that character actually plays at the table when you're bouncing that personality or that character off other players can be quite different than what you expect. And so quite often mega dungeons and playing through mega dungeons, they need to take on the, um, the party's uh, goals, desires, uh, what they want to do in the dungeon, what they want to do when they're out of the dungeon. And that then you get buy-in and that's how a mega dungeon can maintain itself. All right. That's interesting because there's some similarities and differences to when we were asking, I think we were asking this question with like Justin Alexander about mega dungeons on one of the earlier episodes. It may have been a different guest um, who agreed with a lot of what you said there about the PCs having their connections and it needing to be able to in react to how the players explore the dungeon as opposed to just kind of being there and being its own story in advance. But the guest, which I think was Justin, but apologies if it wasn't to him, um, said that mega dungeons are often so big that you might not be able to complete them um, even in one campaign. And they you might have multiple groups that are delving through it, like some of those old um, dungeons in like the very beginning of D&D where they were running multiple groups through the same dungeon. So for me, a lot of mega dungeons have been more like the ones you're talking about, Greg, where it sure is long and it might take the entire campaign that's all 
all in that dungeon, but you probably will finish it or at least do some significant portion in a lot of mega dungeons that I've I've played, but I do know there are those even bigger ones too. Yeah, that's, I agree. I agree with that uh, for sure. And the the um, you know, so we we spoke just briefly before we started about uh, you know how like what what's the the point of the mega dungeon? Why bother? Well, the hobby, if we know our history, started in the mega dungeon. Uh, that's where the that's where the hobby began. It began in Castle Greyhawk. It began in uh, El Raja Key. Uh, began in Castle Blackmore. These are the these are the places where where the game began. So to write these things is to write yourself into the history of the hobby. Now, Barrel Maze, for example, which is the first one I did, is very much a reaction to what I hated about published Mega Dungeons to that point. So if I was to speak generally. I would say they weren't playable out of the box or when you opened up the cover. Um, there was no coherence. Uh, there would be some, you know, not there, there was no sort of like general motif that sort of brought it together. So what I wanted with Barrel Maze, for example, is I wanted it to be themed. So we've got this huge undead uh, presence that's underneath these barrel mounds, which have never been fully exploited as a cool motif in Dungeons and Dragons at any point. And then uh, from there, uh, you know, it's um, uh, it, what that does is it puts more pressure on the cleric class than it does necessarily some of the other other classes. So just like Highfell puts a little bit more pressure on uh, magic users or mages and uh, and so on. So the, the cleric is a very important, more important character, just like the dwarf would be, uh, dwarf race would be in Duero Deep, for example. And I don't have any problem at all putting a little emphasis here and there on those kind of things because it makes it a little bit more of a unique experience. So I definitely have seen um, criticisms of some published adventures that are out there of not being able to be played outside the box or just kind of telling you, yeah, you're going to have to fill this in. Here's where it goes. Especially like there's like a few of the earlier 5e ones that are known to have that that criticism as well. I do feel there there are others out there that that give you what you need, but I think it is good to get especially if the GM was going to be reactive and let the players make their story in the dungeon. They need all that stuff in advance. They need to understand not just what monsters and creatures live there, but their motivations and like what factions are all in there so that they can understand and try to adjudicate like when the players do something weird or unexpected that's not just engaging directly into a fight and going right into combat, like how they can get that to work. Unless they're like an expert at improvising ahead of time, in which case the, I think some of the people who want to buy a published adventure want a little help with that. So it does make sense to include it. Sure, and I, you know, just to take, you know, are like as uh, as designers to take, you know, throw ourselves right on the sword. Um, you can play test things to your heart's content, but but uh, you, there's going to be things you don't anticipate. And one of the things I did in Barrow Maze is I have little shadow boxes where I speak directly to the person running the game, and I tell them very clearly, like, so in this room when we played it, this happened, and there's no way on this earth I would have ever expected that result. And so here's what we did, uh, you know. So so you know those are those are I think um, you know those self-deprecating moments when you're you're trying to think of everything and make sure you have all your bases covered, and then you smack your forehead and geez, I forgot that, or there's something that you just did never anticipate because there's always going to be that with interesting and intelligent players. So you know uh, I think people appreciated some of those little uh, shadow boxes in that adventure. That's one. You know you're 100 percent right that there's you're never going to guess it. I remember. When we were, um, one of the authors who was writing a short adventure at Paizo happened to be like one of the editors and ran it for the other editors at Paizo. And they just did something so wild and they tried to like recruit like the main villain and like a few other things. And then the author was like, oh, okay. Well, I, 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 and I, I think one of them wanted to kill them and the other people wanted to recruit them. And it was like a conflict among the team. And so they were like, I've learned a lot from this, and I can put that into the adventure to um, take that into account. 
Yeah, so it's good. It's good if you're going to play test not only to do it with the the very savvy, experienced veteran player, but do it with inexperienced players too. Because you know um, we're thinking about this stuff all the time, pretty much every day, right? But but the person who just shows up to say their twice monthly game, um, they're not necessarily thinking in those terms. And it's good to play with both groups because you can get a different get a different feedback from them. It's true. Not only do they potentially show something that you had just like got in your head, an assumption that you thought you knew and that they didn't know and that they would need to know in order to run the game that you would just never have thought of. But sometimes they can think of something creative that people who get locked in the box of having played the game for forever won't think of. I remember I was running for a group of like young players who had never played before mostly. And um, one of them, there was Harpies, and she was like, I'm looking at my spell component pouch, and it says that my my minor image illusion spell has wool as its material component um, that I use because of pulling the wool over their eyes or whatever it is. And I'd like to pull that out and stuff it in my ears to try to not hear the harpy song. And like I've been playing with experienced players for decades who... I don't think would have ever come up with that, but like in in her very first session, she was just like, I'm going to put the wall in there. I was like, that's fantastic. I, I will definitely let you do that. I can't believe you looked to see what all the components that you had for your spells were. That's, that's great. Yeah. And, uh, and then a whole nother different group, you get like a, 11 year olds 12 get a group of 11 year olds or 12 year olds and then you don't even like have to half line them up they're they're gone like they're just away and and that's the most interesting thing because you have to really be on your toes like they're so creative they haven't had the creative uh, creativity crushed out of them by school yet and uh and they're just off to the races and they're fun, really fun and challenging to play with so let me ask you because i love mega dungeons but only really to read them and I have run a couple of mega dungeons, and every time we ran them, uh, we never finished them, and we stopped, and we didn't like them. And the last one that I ran was the Emerald Spire, and the big issue I have with these, and that seemed like a good idea, because every level was written by someone different, so every level was cool and was completely you know, like had a completely different... I mean, that did have the coherence issue Greg talked about, though, well, because they were very you, different. You, you cut me off at the knees, I was getting to that, is that now, after hearing Greg talk, what you said makes sense, is that it was very incoherent, and I tried to make it a little bit more mm -hmm. co coherent, but actually, the fact that every level was different turns out to be a detriment, and it's not a good thing, but a bad thing, because... Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened. Like people just, we just stopped playing. It was like, you know, it sounds fun, but you know what? Fighting endlessly without a connection and a story and a reason is just boring. You know, it's just, it just ends up being, especially in a role playing like, game. There theoretically was a meta plot to it, but it was very it was difficult very for the players hard. to find it. Yeah. And it was only in a few places because the authors, I think, were just, some of them were very famous authors because it was like mm -hmm. a big, Kickstarter incentive for the um, Kingmaker, uh, or the um, I know what you're the about. M the MMO they were they were trying to do for Pathfinder yeah, yeah. Online, mm -hmm. um, and so that caused it, I think, to be a little bit less connected than it might have been mm -hmm. otherwise. Well, so, you know the um, so the Mega Dungeon. Uh, is like if you ask yourself like, look, like how busy people are and how often they get to play does a mega dungeon make sense relative to how often people get to play and the answer is no probably not but are they inspiring oh heck yeah they are super inspiring and again they touch back to the origins of the hobby so what i've tried to do with each project i've tried to expand the notion of the mega dungeon well, also, so it's a, co a coherent mega dungeon on its own. But having said that, let's say you wanted to run a little bit of a hex crawl. Uh, what you could do is you could take the barrel mounds from um, from barrel mates. You could take the some of the caves from Archaea. You could take some of the wizard towers from Highfell. And you could just sprinkle those into a random table across your hex crawl, and and it's absolutely you can play it as a coherent whole, or you can 
piece it up into little bits to suit to suit your campaign. And uh, so th that's um, I I've had an eye to your question, Stephen, and it's a good one. Uh, both having a coherent whole and yet at the same time uh, being able to take things out for your specific campaign. That makes sense because if you don't have an a la carte option, sometimes people can get overwhelmed and be like, well, if I can't do the whole thing, I can't do it at all. There's That's an right. interesting comment in chat from someone who was saying that what they liked in them in Barrow Maze is people who ran off because they got frightened and then they uh, wound up getting into other ad adventures and mischief and hijinks from that. Great. Yeah, well, I, the thing is the players get to choose. So what I would do is I would sprinkle some rumors in. One of them might be Barrow Maze or one of them might be Archaea. And, but at the end of the day, if they pick the one that's uh, Baltron's Beacon, then we're off to Baltron's Beacon. And if they want to circle back around to, uh, to Barrow Maze, they can do that too. And you know, part of it, um, when, when, I, when I create, a, I create, I'm an academic. So when I think about a project, I, I go at it as an academic would, I create a, a, a preliminary reading list and that includes primary sources, so uh, RPG product from the period under study, or um, secondary sources like uh, from history or archaeology or anthropology. And then I read through those to to see where I can marry uh, history with with gaming. And so that's helpful um, to to really find your groove if you're thinking about writing in any dungeon or a mega dungeon. And then also, you know, where you want to um, deviate from that and where you want to stay a little bit closer. So, uh, you know, the, my parents are from the UK, so uh, I was always fascinated with standing stones and uh, barrel mounds and and things of that nature. So that was just a natural first project for me. And and being, you know, like a lot of men, I'm a visual learner first, so I can I can close my eyes and I can see exactly what I'm looking for. And then it's from there to to take that idea, that vision, and then put it on paper and uh, outline it, and then start to fill out the outline with an acknowledgement to your, uh, your reading list that you've gone through and what's been done in the past and what's your angle on those things and, and uh, what do you, what's the vision for your adventure. Oh man, that takes me back to in school when they talked about like visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learning um, as different learning styles, and it never really seemed to to fit well for me. I I read recently that that that's kind of been discredited as a like an actual thing that is a bucket, but I feel like that's just because we we like to put things into buckets when really it's a, like a broad spectrum of different styles, and it's a simplification. Um, sure. You have to, there are people who are going to learn largely from, or are going to be fired up by illustrations, and then there are people who need to really see the text and, and get into the text, and then the, the illustrations add into the text, but they both have to work in concert. And one of the things that really drives me insane about RPG design is when uh, mechanics don't aren't married with the aesthetic. They have to be lockstep for me personally, and, and if, it, if I see something that doesn't do that, it's kind of like breaks the frame for me. I'd rather move on to something else. Yeah, you want to have the lore, the mechanics, and the aesthetic kind of all working together. And I feel like that that's important, not that's important for like pretty much any reader, I think, if you really want to get them into it. It's not like a breakdown of like certain ones or and, and not others. But well, the, Oh, sorry, continue. Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just I was just amused and coming back to the idea of of um, fear leading people into other encounters because that that remind uh, that seems like it's to me part of the emergent design of of uh, and the emergent gameplay that is very popular in OSR in general where it's like it wasn't the GM's plan it wasn't even the player's plan because they didn't plan to get hit by a fear and run away in a random direction. And nobody knew that they were going to go to that encounter at that time. And it looks like this person is playing your Barrow Maze and like had a really good time with um, just the chaos that came from that. Well, if you go back to the primary sources about looking at undead in folk tales and in children's stories, and then you read them all and you sit back and say, OK, what's the motif? What, what's, what's the overriding theme being communicated? And it's fear. And so this is one of the things, you know, people, some people don't like level draining from undead in OSR games versus not. I know everyone has an opinion on that, but I'm totally okay with it because they're supposed to inspire dread. 
and they're supposed to inspire fear. And there's a place for that in the game, in the game that I like to play. So yeah, for sure, fear is is great. And I mean, if you feel if you're playing an RPG and you're in some creepy crypt, and that hair on the back of your neck stands up, and you're at the table rolling dice, something good's happening for sure. Yeah, if you actually can feel fear, like um, my wife Linda, when she was running her first game for a um, a full group, was running a sewer. Actually, ironically, it, it connects to your your issue that you have with some other dungeons because it didn't have everything you needed. It actually just said, "Well, we don't have everything for this sewer. You need to fill in the rest of the sewer." And so she did, but she also herself was getting nervous from it and she channeled that into us so we all got so freaked out in that sewer my character had like a linked summoned creature that was getting hurt in another area that nobody saw causing like bloody wounds to appear all over her body mm -hmm. and everybody was so freaked out that at the end one of the players was like i'm loving this i'm gonna make a new character for next session though because i think my character is too traumatized to continue the adventure after what they just experienced in that sewer. I'm going to make a different character because that, that was how they, like the player wasn't traumatized or upset at all. The player um, was going along with it, was having fun, but was like, I know what my character was feeling. And this was not something that, um, that they want to do again. And this was their first experience with adventuring. And so just, they just went to paint moody paintings in their temple and they were there as an NPC for the rest of the game. That's funny. Yeah. Um, we had a super chat that says regarding process i have trouble with the actual process of making a mega dungeon i find i can't build a lot of rooms and fill it out quickly especially when i'm aiming for a large set piece yeah so i would say uh um and i i tell you know the people i work with all the time um good writing comes from good outlines and crappy writing comes from crappy outlines and the same thing with adventure writing or mega dungeons. If you've got a crappy outline, it's probably going to be a wandering, aimless mega dungeon. But if you know what it is you want and you've thought that out on paper, you have a, a vision for what it feels like, what it looks like, and why it's there. Then the how, how do I make these little rooms? How do I make the set piece rooms? will start to come together. And there's a great quote. I don't know if either of you remember the uh, the Irish rock band, The Pogues, but um, Shane McGowan, who was their lead singer, he had a great quote. And someone asked him one time, you know, how do you come up with these great, great songs? And he said, um, well, you just, you come up with the melody and the lyrics just suggest themselves. And what, what he was speaking about is the nature of the creative process that you don't have to have all the letters of the alphabet between A and Z known. They can just play themselves out one by one, day by day, stick to that process, and things will start to fall into place. And then sometimes you're gonna look at things that you've written and you're like, you know, this is hot garbage. It's really, really bad. Everyone's going to hate me, this sucks. And that's totally okay. That is part of the creative process. Every creative, whether you're an artist or a game designer or anything else, you question what you're doing. And that's a good thing. That's a big green flag because it matters to you. You want to do the right thing. You want it to be good. And you're questioning whether it's good enough or not. So those are good things to think about. And, and those are your green flags to know, hey, I'm, I'm probably doing okay even though I don't think the stuff I'm writing right at this exact moment is super awesome. Right. If you, as a writer, are just convinced that your stuff is going to be perfect no matter what, it can't be wrong, you don't need anyone else to read it, you don't need to read it again later, like just your your like worldview and your words just have to be right. Like that's not going to work in, in a tabletop RPG. You need to look at it again later after you've let it cool down for a while, you get someone else to look at it too. Like Greg said, make some of them be inexperienced gamers because they might notice something that you and your experienced buddies took for granted in the game design because you were like, well, everyone knows that that's what you do for this mechanic, but that an inexperienced gamer might be like, well, you never said it though. It doesn't give you everything you need. The more passes you can get from editors, developers, 
play testers, the better product you're going to put out. You, I, I agree. It's like, it's definitely a, to me, a red flag when someone is like, well, I don't need any passes on this. I don't want anyone to look at it, but a good designer is probably one who's always a little nervous. It'd be like, did I get this right? Um, is this good enough? Can I make it better? Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. You, that's exactly the perspective that I encourage uh, folks out there. If they're thinking about doing something to, to take, uh, be your own judge and jury and be super harsh. And, uh, and then once you think you've got it, you know, send it to the people that you trust and get some feedback and, uh, and take it from there. But it's always important to remember that, um, that, it, you know, your, your vision for it, uh, is, is key. So get your feedback and, and then examine feedback critically, decide what, okay, you know, this is, this is actually pretty good. This is a good thought. I need to include this. And these other ones, these are pretty good, but it really doesn't fit what I'm going for. So I'm not going to include those. Like be critical about each one and fair to each criticism and then incorporate what you can and, and then move forward for sure. Yeah, oftentimes what you'll find, especially when you go and try to get play testers or people who maybe aren't as experienced with design, is that they're going to give you comments that are true to their experience right. and they are true. They, they truly did have an issue or a problem or found something that, that caused that made it harder for them. Mm -hmm. But they may identify a solution or tell you a thing that needs to be changed to cause that issue to be fixed that you as the designer realize that's not, they think that's going to fix their problem because they have diagnosed a symptom that, or they found a symptom that was causing them an issue in their gameplay, but really there's an underlying cause. And if you fix that change, maybe either doing that will break something else or it won't fix the problem, or it isn't the best way to do it. And you might find, actually, I can make that experience better for them if I do something completely different that they never thought of. Yeah, and I had a great piece of advice that was given to me a long time ago when I was working on academic writing. And um, one of my mentors said, you know, um, writing is never really finished. It's only ever abandoned. Mm -hmm. And and what that means is that, so you have this kind of like thing that you're working on, like a baby, and you're working on it every day, and you're doing so month after month and year after year. And then eventually the time is going to come when you have to give it up to the world. And what you hope is that your process, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, has been grinding and good enough that when it does, it floats in the, in the industry of ideas and doesn't sink. And sometimes it might, and sometimes you know, it'll float, but hopefully in the majority of time, it's going to float if you're conscientious and you're determined to do a, do a good job. So that's one of the things I've always um, tried to remember and, and not try to, you want to beat yourself up, but you don't want to go overboard about it. So, yeah, I think that makes sense. Tell me a little bit about each of your dungeons. So you have four dungeons out here. Barrow Mage, I Fell. Ooh, this is a long one. The Forbidden Caverns of Archaea. Archaea. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it Dwaro Deep? Dwaro Deep. Mm -hmm. Dwaro Deep. So you have four mega dungeons. I, I mean, I'm always impressed. I think we write a lot. And then I look at this and I'm like, this is insane. How many years did it take you to put out those four mega dungeons? That's so oh, much. Uh, since, well, over a decade, closer to 15 years. That but, makes sense, um, given how much. I know. Well, now so, that, that don't feel as bad. <laughs> I was like, holy crap, that was a lot of work. So the short version would be with Barrow Maze. So, we, you know, we have this historical idea going all the way back to Castle Greyhawk of these like themed levels that kind of correspond with character level, right? So what I wanted to do is with Barrow Maze, I wanted to create what I call a dungeon sprawl. So there are no real staircases that are signaling to players you're moving to level two or a sub-level of level two or level three or so on. You could literally go from the first level and wander into the third or from the first into the second or from the second to the fourth. And, uh, and it's only through exploration, not battle, exploration that you can determine what area you're in and figure out what's going on. And I love that because it uh, doesn't make the game predictable. Um, so the next one was Caverns of Archaea. So we're all familiar with uh, keeping the borderlands and the caves of chaos from way back in the day. Uh, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to stretch it vertically. 
And I, if you can imagine the caves of chaos in uh, the Grand Canyon, that's what, what Archaea looks like. And the meta is that the, all these, um, these evildoers are putting together these bands of monstrous humanoids to create a war on, on uh, civilization. And then Heifel is a, uh, is a uh, floating um, mage school. It was on the top of a mountain. It breaks away and it floats across this, uh, this uh, aimless expanse. And then so how you get up there and how you get down is sort of an interesting problem and puts pressure on mages. And then the last one was the uh, was Dwero Deep. And so I'm a person, when I play RPGs, I really enjoy playing dwarves, dwarven fighters, dwarven clerics, things like that. So uh, in my opinion, the, um, you know, if we look back to Tolkien and we think of Moria, Moria is the first, as the ubiquitous dungeon, as every dungeon. And, but that had never really been married to Dungeons and Dragons in any, any realistic way, any playable way. So I took on the challenge of trying to marry the version of the game that I enjoy with the experience of exploration in Moria. And the result was uh, what I call Dwero D. And it was, um, it, so for those of your viewers, if you remember the AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide, right at the back, there were these little sort of like, there was over about four pages, there were these little like illustrations that showed a party of adventurers against some kobolds. And then on the next page, it was a, the same party of adventurers against some trolls. And the next one, the same party of adventures against some devils and so on and so forth. And so it showed progression of these player characters across four pages. And when I was, I always think pie in the sky, like when I'm thinking about um, how I want it to present, how I want to present a mega dungeon on paper, I think to myself, what would be like the coolest, most awesome thing I could possibly do? And then can I do that? Do I have the resources, the means, the wherewithal to do that? And so what I did was I did that same kind of progression, but I did it over 150 pages where each illustration matches the content of the page. And what I'm hoping to do with that, it's almost like a comic strip in a way of, dungeon, of playing Dungeons and Dragons, but it's to get the, uh, the person running the game fired up. Because if they're fired up, then they're communicating that to the players and they're fired up. And now everyone's you know, feeding off each other's energy at the table. So you know, those are some of the things that... Uh, um, that I was thinking about you know, relative to each individual dungeon. That makes sense. I mean, the Caverns of Archaea, just the name to me evokes the name The Caverns of Thracia by mm -hmm. um, Janelle Jacquet. Yeah. Is there um, any connection to that, or is it more of a keep on the borderlands? No, well, uh, it's a little bit of both, but certainly mm -hmm. I think we're all um, grateful to Janelle Jacquet and, and her contribution to the hobby and certainly thinking about how to design dungeons and multiple entrances and things like that. So, yeah, there was a little bit of a tip of the cap to her there, but also the Caves of Chaos. And then it had my spin uh, on it. I, I just I was like, well, the Caves of Chaos was like really cool when we first played it. But so the people, if you advance the timelines, so the people who are my age, if you're playing in the late 70s or the early 80s with uh, some of the original editions, like um, how can I make that fresh and new for, uh, for, for that group? So, you know, the people I'm writing for have played pretty much every edition, uh, but they prefer OSR games and they are really, they're well read, they're very intelligent and they want to be challenged intellectually. And so if I'm, now, the, the, those group of, of those people are formidable because they know what they like and they know what they don't. And if I can succeed in writing for them, then then I know I'm, I'm probably doing OK. That makes sense. I mean, especially I think a lot of designers have a mindset that's based um, somewhat on our design, on the people we've played with, the people that we know and the people that we are writing for. Like all my different home groups and organized play experience are part of what helped me to learn what worked and what didn't work in certain game systems and use that in designing new game systems as well. For sure. Like I'm, you know, I'm um, uh, very much, uh, I'm a Gygaxian D and D man. That's uh, that's where it's at for me. Um, I can look at, you know, I can see different uh, designers contributions to the game as it moved on with Wizards of the Coast. And I can, you know, there's not, I, I'm not a huge fanboy. Now, do I see some, 
pretty cool innovations there that I liked. Absolutely. And I think those were some of those were really good. Uh, but given taken all together, I much rather prefer the uh, the, the TSR uh, additions. And, and one of the things we it's important to remember um, and particularly when I talk to students about uh, role playing games versus um, computer games, is that you know everything that's happened in computer role playing games um, or or modern tabletop already happened um, during TSR. I mean, you have this huge legacy and history to go back and review. Not only how designers made decisions, but uh, publicity things, the uh, satanic moral panic. There are so many lessons that we can learn uh, through the history of the hobby and apply to our current circumstance. And uh, so that, that's one of the things that's uh, important when I think. I, I'm very much, being a historian, I, I really respect the history of the hobby, the people that made it what it is. And and it certainly gave me a lot. Like It was sort of a precursor into intellectual study and academic study uh, for me, um, learning about medieval history and you know, guy actually really loved his pole arms. So, you know, trying to look up what all these pole arms meant and what they would have looked like if your character was holding one was uh, part of my youth and upbringing. I definitely learned a lot of vocabulary and mm -hmm. like historical stuff from the various editions of Dungeons and Dragons. That is, is 100% true. And math from the probability of dice. Uh, absolutely. Like, it's not an exaggeration to say that, like, like I did like math competitions as a kid and I won in a division by like an exact one point. And so, at least some of those were probability questions I probably wouldn't have gotten if I didn't play Dungeons and Dragons as a kid. So like it made a difference for me in something that I was actually doing and that um, people are like, how did you get that? I was like, you know, I play Dungeons and Dragons. I have to do more complicated dice probabilities than this when I'm deciding whether to attack this ogre or to like pour hot oil on them. Right. Yeah, I know. Same here. It gave, it gave me more than I could ever give it back. And, and that's how I've always preceded it. And um, so, yeah, it uh, it had me, you know, nose deep in in books, uh, trying to decipher with a with a, a thesaurus and a dictionary and, and the rest of it, trying to decipher what exactly Gygax was saying. And then from there, trying to translate it to the tables, to figure out how to play. So tell us a little bit about Dragon Slayer. What was your sure. goals and... You know, what prompted you to do a whole new game? <laughs> I mean, it's like, you're like, ah, I'm sick and tired of doing Mega Dungeons. Let's just write a whole new Or like, in particular, why, why Dragon Slayer and not one of the other OSR games that has a, at least a similar design goal of going for a, yeah. um, a new but retro clone experience? Right. And you were sure. using Labyrinth Lord. I don't even know what Labyrinth Lord is, but you were using that at one point, right? Yeah. So, so that that was like a, a close to BX uh, Mold Bay Basic 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what happened was when I when I thought about publishing Barrow Maze, I was like, okay, well, what's out there at the moment that is closest to my home game? So, that's what I did. But you know, you don't have to go very far in Barrow Maze to see that I'm I'm leaning to AD and D from that. I'm not writing true. I wasn't writing true to that rule set at the time. And uh, any new spells and, and monsters and magic items were also leaning that way because that's how we played in my home game. And uh, so why, why Dragon Slayer? Well, um, we've re I've reached a point where uh, I, I can't be beholden to uh, somebody else's game. So if somebody, for example, isn't supporting their game or they yeah, abandon their game or whatever it may be, I need to I need to have my feet under me and moving forward. So that was a big part of it. So the second part of it is um, in a lot of OSR rule sets, we have what Stephen was talking about earlier with big gaps in you know layout and uh, or perhaps the art doesn't really represent the mechanics uh, or the aesthetic that you're going for, and that bugs me. And after many years of it, it would just, it got, got on my nerves, then add in the whole OGL debacle from last year. And I was like, this is, this is halfway done. I need to, I need to get this done. So if we, let's take for, uh, one of the things that we do in history is called counterfactuals. So counterfactuals are when you look back at a historical situation and you say, okay, well, 
how would that historical situation have played out if we take this out or we put this in? So let's play that together. So if we were, uh, let's say Gygax and Arneson are rolling along uh, towards the, the late 70s and they didn't have a falling out. Um, they shared royalties. They did their thing. However, just for the sake of argument, let's say that that happened. So if that happened, AD and D wouldn't have happened. And if it did, the impetus to get it out sooner to therefore screw Arneson out of royalties would not have happened. So what would Dungeons and Dragons have looked like if they stuck with effectively BX and carried that forward? And for me, Dragon Slayer is what that game would have looked like. It would have had the engine of BX because it was simple and easy to run versus what we saw later in AD and D. And but it had the chrome and the texture and the variety of AD and D. And so for me, that's what Dragon Slayer does. And then there are some there were some annoying tweaks in things that uh, needed to get addressed from AD and D. So I addressed those, and uh, and then bring it forward in a cohesive, coherent way where the, the mechanics fall into the background and you're just not having to uh, worry about weapon speed factors uh, versus AC or whatever, <laughs> all those bad rules that nobody played with anyway. So that's kind of why Dragon Slayer came about. And why now? Well, because of the OGL debacle, because I was working on it already, and because this is the 50th anniversary of the game. The moment you talked about getting your legs under you, I knew that the OGL debacle would would come into it too. And as also someone who's designing things, I get why you would want to have your legs under you. It can be it can be stressful and scary to have the option and the possibility of things like dissolving or shifting, and you don't know what you can do. You don't know what you'll be allowed to do, even if you're allowed to do it. There might be things that your customers want you to do that you can't with the new license, and um, now that that all makes sense to me. That's a that is a good answer. <laughs> yeah, and there are people who say, "Well, you know, do why do we need a, a, a another BX phone?" Well, you don't um, necessarily. However, if you want the best art with the best layout um, communicated in a very tight one hundred and fifty five thousand words. Then, then I think then there's another choice for you if you're interested in that, and um, and if you're and the other part too is there's a third party license so people can create and go crazy and uh, and I, I hope that they do uh, create modules and and because you know we're I, I'm working in that version of the OSR where we're all sharing TSR DNA. Um, if if your home game is second edition, um, and, or you know you can you can play my modules with that. You could take Dragon Slayer and you could play it with second a second edition module. You could take Dragon Slayer. You could play it with uh, a basic um, module as well. So because we're all sharing that that DNA, there's not only the new OSR stuff you can play it with. You can play with you know almost uh, 35 years of TSR stuff, and that's important to me. Um, it's it's just uh, I have great great respect for those early TSR. Uh, designers and second great uh, second generation of designers and artists as well, um, formulating the game that that we love so much. So tell me, what are your favorite? I don't know, campaigns, dungeons, mega dungeons that you run that are not yours. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good caveat. Mm -hmm. um, well. Um, I would consider the original Temple of Elemental Evil a uh, mega dungeon. Um, mm -hmm. So I that's one of my favorites. So that would be uh, right at the top. There are aspects of other, like for example, you know, I'm a huge Ed Greenwood fan. Like he, I'm a super fanboy of his. Like he's just so um, amazing and creative and prodigious. But I was never a huge fan of Undermountain. I think Undermountain is probably like the coolest uh, mega dungeon name you could possibly think of. Uh, so, but having said that, the idea of a mega dungeon under a city doesn't do anything for me at all. 
like for me, um, Dungeons and Dragons, like if we're talking about like fundamental tenets of the game, like what my ontology would be as a designer, um, Dungeons and Dragons happens on the frontier. It's like at the periphery uh, of civilization, not necessarily in civilization. I've never played in a city campaign I ever enjoyed. Um, but uh, but I think getting out there where uh, lines of supply are thin, um, you're on your own, and now you're looking around the table at your uh, brothers and sisters um, all relying on each other. And I think that's one of the great things uh, about the game and, and the exploration uh, aspect of it. So there are things I would I would um, cherry pick, but there aren't too many I would, would want to run uh, as they exist. And one of the reasons is that we spoke about it earlier. It's just not done cover to cover. And that leaves things like Steven, when you were building that mega dungeon, like in real time with um, Baron, that was like the 365 room mega dungeon that was all done in one day, you guys had to leave a few rooms at the end. You almost got it, but you ran out of time. That's not and you my were like, well, fault. these, these mm -hmm. ones are left as an exercise for the GM. And that's exactly did, what Greg was saying about not, not completing Greg, all you of, the, of your did mega you see, dungeon. Did you see us build that mega dungeon? I'm sorry, say again? Did you see us? So, uh, Baron Durop, at the beginning of the year, decided that he wanted to build a 356-room mega dungeon in 10 hours. And he had different people come on, and each person would take a certain portion of it. And this was on, like, January 1st. Because last year, there was this... It was dungeon a day where people were trying to do a dungeon room a day. And you mm -hmm. should watch. It's really funny. And we were on there. I was on there. Professor Dungeon Master was on there. Bob World Builder was on there. Um, there was a lot of people were on it. And I came at the very end. And he only had, like, an hour left. And we're only up to room, like, 200 and, like, 30. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I built 117 rooms with him in... Uh, well, we brought in more people, and then by the end, now you can only go live up to 12 hours on YouTube, so we went mm -hmm. a little over, and it's because we only had an hour, and we weren't going to do 100 and, uh, whatever, 30 rooms, or 140 rooms in an hour, so we brought some more people in, and we went over, and I think we went for two, two and a half hours, or maybe three hours, uh, but I ended up building 117 rooms in two and a half, three hours, so... Mm -hmm. That was my mega dungeon uh, experience right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, not uh, people don't. Um, well, not all rooms need to be created equal. Oh, you we were fl you want rooms Yo. where there's very little happening, and then you want your set piece rooms too, which are which are the ones that'll be very very memorable well, and then all the, yeah. all the variety in between those. Well, what we had to do is that we actually had there was a there was a boss, and I was doing the end, so we had to have this area for the goblins and then we had like this whole area where there's like a little stage and then there was like a poker room and there was like you know i actually made it like a and if you think about it it's like okay let's pretend it's an office boom that's 10 rooms right there you know like it's like you know just pretend it's a dungeon office because then it's like okay this is the bathroom this is the poker room this is the closets this is the sleeping quarters like you need all that stuff so that was pretty quick uh but then we actually had to get to the final boss and he had the dungeon being dynamically generated by a script so the dungeons would be made using uh, the tiles and then we would fill mm -hmm. it in and it was like insane and then finally at the end we brought in like four people and we each did one room and then at the very end when there's literally like two minutes left he goes why don't i do this at the beginning because <laughs> like now we're flying because like, people are doing instead of one room at a time everyone was writing one room and i i did the boss and someone else did the rooms around the boss and then we were done because like, all five of us are writing one room at once so we could have finished this thing in three hours if we if we did it that way but maybe next time um <laughs> are you gonna do another one next year it sounded like a blast it was amazingly fun <laughs> and he he wrote me i was in i was in uh where was i uh columbia when he wrote me he's like oh you want to want to do a dungeon with me i'm like when he's like uh january 1st i'm like uh okay i guess i'm like what are we doing he's like oh we're just gonna write a mega dungeon real quick 
I'm like, is that sure. Columbia University, Columbia, South America, Columbia, Maryland, Columbia, South America, Cartagena? Ah, okay, and I was in Cartagena. That's what he wrote me. I was like, all right, sure. And then Seems I get like a good idea from down there. Yeah, well, no, I came back. It was like right when I came back too. So okay. I was like, like I, I was thinking because it's like, well, Stephen's in New York. He could have met the university, but it sounds like he met a place. So no, I had no, to no. clarify for our viewers. Well, yeah, because they don't know where I go on vacation. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you can watch it. It's really fun. It goes fast. Even though it's a 12 hour stream, because everyone, because he keeps mixing people in. But you could tell because in the beginning, it's only with Professor Dungeon Master, I think he did like six rooms. You know, like these people are like really thinking it out and they're like doing it. I'm like, uh, this room, it has a table and they're playing cards. Next room. Okay, they are, <laughs> it's a closet. It has broken weapons and gear and uh, food on the floor. Next room. Yeah. I mean, I am. I went fast, as fast as he could write. You know, I was like, you just got to freaking fly, man. And, but I presume when you do Mega Dungeons, you put a little bit more thought into them, Greg. But <laughs> yeah, I I, um, I built in. So I do what's called semi-random. So okay. uh, I have I know my set piece rooms, um, and I do want some randomness in my results. Mm -hmm. So because that inspires creativity, and I like to be surprised. And it also gets you out of your comfort zone. So I think oftentimes we can get a little too close to our comfort zone, and um, that often makes for boring role playing. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you can sort of include some randomness when you're thinking about how you want to draft your results, that's very helpful. So how do you handle leveling? I mean, like, like now it's traditional dungeon. See, this is why I thought writing a mega dungeon would be fun. It's because I. I'm so old that I used to play Rogue, and I mean the ASCII version of Rogue, not not Diablo Rogue, like Rogue Rogue, you know, like the real thing, on like a Linux computer. And I love Rogue, which is kind of a mega, it's basically a mega dungeon. And, you know, one of the aspects of these games is as you go down the levels, they get harder, and you know they get harder. And it's the mm -hmm. unwritten rule that, like, level one is for level one, and level two is for level two, and level three is for level, you know, you, yeah. know you, you have that unwritten rule. And it's fun, and I, I always loved that, but maybe because it's a single-player experience, and it's quick, and you only played for a few hours, and then it's done, as opposed to living, breathing, playing with other people for months if not years in like this one environment, it could get boring, you know? So like, how do you like spice that up and make sure that they're leveling up and they have like a place to go? I mean, you do add towns and villages and things around the dungeon so that it's not just the dungeon and there's a little bit of, you know, back and forth. Um, oh, you have to have a base of operations. You right. definitely want some interesting characters in town to, to, um, talk to and people who can give you maybe a few leads on uh, uh, if players aren't picking up things in the dungeon relative to clues and the the larger uh, plot that's that's often in the background. And when you're thinking about a mega dungeon, um, you and, and I, I did some play sessions of uh, Dragon Slayer online on YouTube. If anybody's interested, what you'll see is the the primary um, uh, antagonist is not they're not not the monsters it's the dungeon environment mm. so i'm making the dungeon environment lethal and that's the first adversary and then as they're moving through that they may encounter other groups that might be the second adversary and the boss for those groups might be a third and then when they get past those there could be another series of things and that's all um that's all uh considered from multiple entrances. They might not go into the first entrance that they see. So you have to think about it in different terms. Now, I'm not, I have no, you know, because I'm coming from an old school mentality, um, my players are going to choose where they're gonna go. And we might have a session where there's very little XP. And then we might have another session where there's quite a lot and everything in between. It's not going to even out because it's player driven. The players are going to make the decisions on where to go and what to do. And uh, therein, you know, when I think Dungeon Dragons really changed for me when when we moved from like an older versions, you're doing one to one, one gold piece equals one experience point. 
And then for monsters, it's really just about one to 10. So most of the time you want to avoid monsters, you want to get their treasure, and then you want to get out without combat. So it's very much an exploration game. Um, you want to cheat, fly, connive, uh, create traps, uh, fight on ground of your choosing, fight on high ground, uh, do all those things that Sun Tzu said in The Art of War in order to uh, take advantage. And so at the end of the day, I, have, I don't worry about leveling at all. When the experience allows it, we level. And when it doesn't, we don't. I mean, that, that just fits in a lot with some of the like core principles of the OSR towards players coming up with clever ideas, try to win the fight before it's even engaged. And if you engaged in a fair fight where you're letting the, the, the game master roll against you on even grounds, then you've already made a mistake in, in a lot of these uh, settings. 100%. So the thing is, uh, and I, I'd encourage you know, your, your viewers to think on this as well, Sometimes you read online that, uh, oh, there's too much DM, fiat, and, uh, and that sort of thing, but that's not true. So, what, so if you're playing veteran BX players, they're going to know that 10 minutes into a dungeon, you're going to make a random monster roll. So they're going to game you, they're going to metagame you on that die roll. So they'll go in for five or seven or eight minutes, and then they'll go back out. Right? And that, that's what they'll do. And so you have to respond with a countermeasure uh, as a dungeon master, right? So you have to think in, in those terms. And it's all, it's all part of the um, uh, players have more agency than they think they do. And that's been given credit for online in the OSR. So, for example, uh, keep dice out of the hands of your dungeon master. As soon as you give me an opportunity to roll dice, I'm going to kill you. That's my job. My job is to kill you. Now, if you keep, if you do things, if you sneak around and you create traps and you only fight on ground of your choosing and you're being smart tactically, well, now you're putting yourself at an advantage whether I get to roll dice or not. So, you know, um, and those are those are important considerations, I think, for any version of D&D, but in particular for OSR version. Yeah, you know, as someone who obviously created a... Um like more modern school game and was one of the creators of one i still do agree with you that modern school games have plenty of gm adjudication as well if anything i would say that um that an old school game where the the gm is actually they don't even know what they're going to do because they just know after 10 minutes, I'm rolling this random encounter table and we'll see what it is. And they know when you go in here, I'm going to roll this D 100 table. It could be any of these things on here that they, um, you know, that that's emergent gameplay that's coming from the die and it's not actually coming from the GM adjudication and the players can therefore have the ability to try to mitigate that by knowing what's going to come up, knowing when randomness is going to appear and and try to skirt around it. Whereas actually in more modern style, the GM might adjudicate to try to like keep things more on track if they, especially if they have a more railroady style, not all modern style games are. There are plenty of sandboxes too, but yep. I feel like old school is not synonymous to me with uh, GM fiat, but sometimes it's synonymous with like, we don't know what's going to happen. The game has its fiat, and and we all get to sort of enjoy the question of like, what's going to happen now? This this is being rolled. Nobody knows. That's right, and and I, um, that could, that's an opportunity for improv for the the DM at the table. Um, so it's like, oh, well, I wasn't expecting that. Um, and then you then now you're you're on the on the uh, in the moment, and you have to convey what's happening to players. And uh, and and when you've played for a long time, that's actually really enjoyable. When you, you know you know the environment, you know the command that you have command of the monsters, and you're doing these things, and you played played for a long time, and and now, oh, well, that's surprising. Now, what do I do? What what are they going to do? And that's fun, hmm. and and unexpected. Yeah, absolutely, and it works. I think. For old school games, it's easier to also roll with those sometimes than in a um, in some more modern games. It depends on which game you're playing, obviously, because mm -hmm. we say old school and modern school, but that that it's what yet again like the visual kinesthetic thing. Like we're just breaking things down with different labels, and really there's a spectrum and there's multitudes in both in both directions. But 
Um, I remember in, in Pathfinder First Edition in Kingmaker, which is a very sandboxy, very hex crawl style. But there was a random encounter table, and there was a chance that there was a shambling mount. And maybe your characters had higher movement speed than a shambling mount, in which case you could run away. It was at first level, sorry. But if you didn't, like, also, it, that it, since that's Pathfinder first, which is based on third edition, you could have, like, pre-built a character that was so min-max that you would just win against anything, and maybe you would win. But if you were, like, kind of a middle of the road not optimized character you were just going to die from that shambling mount if you couldn't escape or at least timmy who had the heavy armor and low movement speed was going to die and the rest of us are going to run away and mourn timmy and if we are smart enough to make that decision and so like i feel like with an old school system though there are m more ways to like come up with a weird clever idea where we like drop a rock on it from a ledge above or something like that um that it is at least more encouraged um than let's do a um let's do a fair fight with this uh or mostly fair fight with this creature yeah no i would agree with you and i think um you know one of the things uh that distinguishes the the styles of play is that there is just there's uh less on the old school character sheet so it's on the player to bring their guile and their wit and their intelligence. And my game's very much an intellectual game where you're matching wits with me. And uh, I will recognize when I've been outwitted and you can you can uh, cruise along and pull out your laurels and rest on them. And there are other times I might outwit you depending on the situation and then it's how do you respond. And and that's a fun, that's a fun game, especially when you've got you know, six or seven people thinking against you, and then and you're you're trying to uh, to bring that to, uh, to the table. So I enjoy it uh, a great deal, and uh, and and hopefully that's uh, a part of people's games in the there in the chat. Yeah, I think it's 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 always fun to me, no matter what RPG I'm playing, because I made that distinction there. But like <laughs> when I'm playing Pathfinder Second Edition, I had a post up on um, one of the Reddit's about my group and um how we had an encounter and we approached it very cautiously and we heard like what sounded like a trap or something going off in the room we backed off we waited for a while hoping that it would be over and then like came back in attacked with range attacks tried to pull the enemies out of their advantageous terrain and i was talking to some other play testers about the content i was play testing about it and they were like because we were play testing some stuff that would like slow down enemies movement speeds and they were like nobody would ever do this right like they would just have charged into the middle of the trap normally and just fought it out and then so i went to reddit i was like what do you guys think like is that that unusual and some people were like well it sounds like your group is more like osr style in terms of their tactics even though they're playing pathfinder 2 and that's um because there are some groups that are just leroy jenkins and they're mm -hmm. just gonna rush right into the the trap that they clearly heard going off and there's like these explosions of energy coming from the area rather than be like, we don't want to go into that. We don't know what's going to happen if we walk into that. Yeah, sniffing out a trap is half the fun for sure. Mm -hmm. So how do you finish and a mega dungeon? <laughs> like it's, it's like, okay, you start it and then you go through it, but like, how does it wrap up? Like, where's the end? Like, you know, I run campaigns with stories, so there's a beginning, middle, and end, and I won't get into... I, I write and do campaigns based on basically movies and scripts, traditional scripting, sort of my whole mm -hmm. thing. So, sure. you know, and I actually ran Kingmaker, and here we go, by the way, Kingmaker, everyone's like, oh, it's the greatest dungeon ever, I love it, everyone loves it, we hated it. <laughs> because well, it was your group your group is not very no. um sandboxy no. your group is you should not do no. osr stuff with no. your group which is actually possibly another reason you didn't have a good time with the mega dungeon because your group which is only you funny don't have a lot of time and you want to do you do a story and they want a railroad and a strict I narrative know. we've been through that in the oh, episode where you're like railroads aren't always bad. i know i know but it's funny just because everyone all these guys started with D D first edition so i guess we've just changed over the years you know maybe uh, i think short. that's what you said that <laughs> yeah. they changed when they got older and they yeah, um, they changed older. their preference but maybe maybe that's not maybe you're thinking something else now yeah well, well if i ran a mega dungeon and i still would like to run it i mean the one I would be interested in is um uh what's the the Pathfinder one um which one 
the the new um, one, the abomination three. vaults. Abomination it's, vaults. Because I hear that it's actually... kind of small for a mega dungeon, but it is a big old dungeon that gets you from like level one to eleven. It's it's I like would a call baby. it a mega dungeon, it's but mega it's dungeon. on like the it's on the smaller end. It's a mega dungeon. It's a small yeah. mega dungeon. It's it's look if you're gonna spend more than half your levels in the dungeon, I think it's a mega dungeon. I think uh-huh. so too. I just like I think it was Justin. I'm gonna keep saying it, and maybe the wrong person came on and was like that. That like that classic mega dungeon may be more than a full campaign of it on. But to right. me, Abomination Vaults is a mega dungeon. So, how do you wrap it up? Because like because because Abomination Vaults actually has a beginning, mm-hmm. middle, and end. Because it is an adventure path. Like, there actually is a story to it, which is why I think of all of them, I'd probably run that. So what what's your opinion, Greg, on, like, how do you have a beginning, middle, and end to a mega dungeon? Should you have a beginning, middle, and end? Should it just be a dungeon that you use to fill in the blanks of your other stories? Should there be a story around it? You know, like, what what is the purpose of these dungeons? I think the, it's the same as if you're playing a classic TSR 32-pager, to be perfectly honest. So there are uh, small objectives, there are medium-sized objectives, there are larger objectives, and those will vary uh, by level, within a level range, one to three, four to seven, seven to nine, and so on. And uh, hopefully you're creating, within the confines of whatever kind of dungeon you're creating, um, you're going to have multiple uh, opportunities to do that. And then those, uh, over time, will go from wide to a little bit more narrow as you come to the main uh, antagonist behind uh, whatever whatever uh, adventure or mega dungeon you're you're taking part in so uh, there needs to be some climactic action the difference between me and perhaps um, other folks would be i'm not going to take the player by the hand from level one to level ten rather uh, if they are conscientious, if they are investigated, if they explore, if they take their time, they will learn slowly but surely. They will pick up all the breadcrumbs that will provide them with enough detail to start to piece together what's happening over time. And over time is the key aspect to it. Not everything needs to be blurted out in the first four or five sessions, but rather, oh, there's something mysterious at play. Okay, well, let's go and and see who can we talk to in town that might have some intel. Um, Is there any intel we can take from the dungeon? Has anybody else been there? Let's go talk to them. And then so uh, we 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 get to the same end points. How we get there might be different. I think that makes sense. It goes back to what you were saying about coherence. If you have a coherent theme to your mega dungeon, it should help to make that finale because it can be whatever the capstone is to that theme. That's right. And they all have them. So if you, if you go through the mega dungeons, there's all, there are a series of um, groups, uh, monsters, bosses, ex- uh, so on that um, quite honestly, you might bump into early on, but you can definitely not take on, you know, that's one of the, the Red Baron's, you know, uh, famous quotes. They he was asked, "How how did you win so many aerial battles in World War One?" Mm. He said, "Because I flew away from the battles I couldn't win." <laughs> and that, that's just smart play. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's always a topic in in RPG um, circles of like, are the PCs just so convinced of their own um, main characterness that they'll never run away no matter what, even when they should. It's a very, it's a very polarizing topic because some groups are like, yeah, of course you're going to run away. Or like my group runs away a lot, but there are other groups that are like, yeah, we wouldn't think to do that. And by the time we do, it's too late. And all these monsters have extra movement speeds and like flying and stuff. So how would we even get away? That would kill us faster. Mm -hmm. Pick your battles mm-hmm. and fight on ground only of your choosing that's prepared. Do all those things and you you may not win, but you will advantage yourself. And folks that have background in the military know this already. And because we're coming from uh, a tradition of historical uh, war games, um, these are natural thought progressions for the tactical component of Dungeons and Dragons. I've often found that like people I know who are like game designers or players who also have done something with the military have a very um, good tactical mindset for like how to deal with uh, maybe not like this one encounter that you're doing, but like 
an encounter area where things might potentially add up uh, uh, together to each other, or like where you should strike first in the building and some of those other sort of, um, I guess, more strategic than tactical points that are like the higher level points. And it's like, oh, yeah. And I would be like, that was a really good idea. And they would be like, oh, yeah, we we learned to we learned about that uh, uh, when we were doing some training in the military. I was like, that makes sense. That's where you learned that. I, I can see that. Mm -hmm. So what is next for you? <laughs> Are you going to do another mega dungeon? Are you going to? Um, come out with some well, music? yeah. So the you've got the four, um, and this has always been a six part project. Oh. So um, the next thing for me, uh, people have been clamoring for a uh, a color map and gazetteer on which all my mega dungeons are set. What, so I'm um, once I take a break from uh, from um, and decompress from Dragon Slayer, I'll start putting the gazetteer together from my notes, getting that ready for publication, and then from there it'll be on to the last two mega dungeons, which will be number five and number six in the series, and then that project will be kind of my life's work and be complete. And then, and then you're done. Then you can die. Like, yeah, then I'll probably try my hand at some thirty TSR style thirty two pagers. Oh, oh okay. So oh, you're gonna you're gonna slum with the with the baby ones. Yeah, yeah I'll, like... I'll go. I'll go make my life really difficult and then work backwards. No, <laughs> that just reminds me too much of so many other people I know in the industry, including myself, just being like, "Yeah, we've got to do this big thing," and then later being like. Okay, I, I've got, I've done it now. Maybe something else. But that's all. Well, this we is do. this is a you know this will be twenty years. Um, yeah, uh, of my life. So it's something that uh, um, you know I, I try to I do my best to make sure that I've got charm and care and thought into the stuff that I'm creating. That the aesthetic is um, consistent. And um, when people see these things over time, um, they're seeing those same things kind of come out. So uh, that. That's uh, that's really kind of where I'm at, and and uh, Dragon Slayer would will fit very neatly in aesthetic and look and layout to to the Mega Dungeon. So if anyone's uh, seen those and you see Dragon Slayer or you check out the trailer um, on YouTube, then you'll have a pretty good idea of what that's all about. So that's Sounds what I've got planned in, in the next little while. Yeah. Awesome. You going to any conventions or? Uh, yeah, so there's uh, two in Ontario, two very small ones in Ontario. I'll go to in April, and I'll go to North Texas RPG Con, which is kind of the epicenter of the OSR, in mm -hmm. early June. Um, uh, not sure through the summer what I'll do, but I'll probably go back to Long Con, which is another Texas uh, convention in November. I really enjoyed it. It was a great little con. They do a great job there. So that's what I have in the, the immediate uh, future, but um, uh, we'll see. I'm open to go to other cons as well. No Gen Con? Or you are going to Gen Con? Uh, well, I've, been, I've done Gen Con three times, and um, it's, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I like the little bit smaller conventions that are um, OSR-centered, and because that's my audience, right? So... I want to make sure that I'm speaking to those people very directly and I'm, I'm meeting folks and, and running games. And uh, I'm not going to say no to going back to Gen Con, but uh, the circumstances would have to be right. I can see how somehow it, you could get swallowed up at Gen Con. Just like when I'm on the dealer hall at Gen Con, walking around trying to find things, I'm inundated with lights and colors and so many things that are shiny. And it's not that it's like, I don't like this stuff mm -hmm. and therefore I don't find anything. It's just like, this is all so good. And therefore I don't find anything because my analysis paralysis is like, I should look at that and that and that and that. I don't know which one I can. I don't have enough time. So then I don't look at any of them. And so I, I get what you're saying. I still really like Gen Con, not because of finding new things at the dealer hall, but because maybe I look something up in advance and can know to check for that or get games and network with people and hang out with folks. Um, there's yeah. a lot of things you can do there. That's it. That's um, so. Yeah, you could go around to Gen Con and not really bump into anybody, and and not really get an opportunity to network. But I know um, that the the conventions I go to uh, now will definitely I will bump into those people, and uh, and then those I've developed very good friendships uh, at some of these conventions. And quite honestly, 
I'd really love to go back to, to GaryCon. It used to be uh, one of the hubs of the OSR, but it's not really anymore. Um, but um, maybe we'll see what the future brings. Okay. All okay. right. Well, it's Valentine's Day, so um, do you think we should wrap it soon, Stephen? What do yeah, you think? I gotta go. I, I mean, gotta go too. I got, so, uh, I got that's stuff good. going on. I got things to do, people to see, yeah. shows to go to. Uh, well, uh, I'm just saying a show. Dinners. Dinners. Well, we have dinner here. So, <laughs> but before that, you know, we didn't plug it once. I forgot to plug this. Mark. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. You didn't even plug the mimic and the yeah, um the backer kit at all this time. People must have been like, "Wow, Steven showed some restraint, and we had so many mini topics. He decided not to." I think you just forgot, right? I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do, this is limited to how, when we sell out. We sell out. So if you want to get a mimic uh, dice guardian, I think there's barely over two hundred left. Period. I don't know how many um, there are left. On, but uh, for the free, um, for free ones. backer ones. Yeah. yeah, for free ones. But if you go to yearmonsters.com or battlezoo.com or rollforcombat.com, eh, you'll find it. It's easy to find. Uh, and then you can get the classic creatures. And get this, Greg. Did you know that Mark wrote that a, uh, you could play a dungeon mm -hmm. as a character? So... And we can actually he make... watched our show, he oh, said, right, 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 Stephen. Right, right. And but... we've advertised so many times I know, that by I now know, he knows I don't, know, what I, I, I don't know how many people he watch can probably now. tell you everything about Eldemon and everything about um, your monster just from all of our ads. I doubt it, but it, I do think. Imagine he played this dungeon. Imagine he played the like, you're like, who are you? I am. Hi, Feld. I am literally this dungeon. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. <laughs> what class would yeah. Barrow Maze be if it was? A, if there was a PC who was like sort of the avatar, the dungeon Claire. avatar of Aramis. Cleric. It's not even close. Yeah, I mean, right? Obviously, it'd be like a cleric of some, sounds like some evil undeath god um, yep. would would probably be the avatar of that dungeon. Yep, that's exactly it. That's funny. What about, um, I don't know, what about any of the others? <laughs> well, Dwaro um, sounds like it would be a dwarf for sure. Oh, yeah, Dwaro's going to be a uh, dwarf for sure. Um, Hypel's going to be a, a wizard, magic user, and uh, Arkay is definitely going to be a fighter. Hmm. Is one of the next ones going to be a thief um, so that you can like round out? Hmm. Maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, I'm not. Uh, I have some qualms about the thief. It really changed mechanically how D and D functioned pre thief, post thief. So I actually banned them in my games for a long time. But uh, um, maybe is the answer to that question. But I'll definitely. I, I like putting pressure on races and classes just to uh, to give it a little twist. And uh, and so we'll see. Yeah, but I didn't I think about OSR people banning Thief, but now that you mention it, it completely fits because there are certain things that maybe players would have just decided to do that now the Thief has like a Thief skill, and now you're like, well, if you don't have that, I guess you can't do it because mm -hmm. it's a Thief ability. Yeah, so, yeah, like pre, you, you'd use qualitative uh, descriptive mechanics to ascertain whether something is trapped and how to disarm it. And, but then when the Thief comes along, now you're just looking at a boring die roll. So uh, do I have those in Dragon Slayer? Yes, I do. But the die roll is always done last after all the qualitative questioning and describing is done first. So that the, the die roll breaks a tie if, if the player hasn't deciphered through questioning with the uh, person running the game how to disarm a trap or find one. So um, and you, there's some ingenious players on how to uh, sometimes I just I'm amazed at the, the great things people come up with for disarming traps that don't involve any roles at all. And like. Okay, yeah, you that that worked. You definitely find out that there's a pit or a uh, tripwire or whatever it may be. <laughs> yeah, my philosophy is if you're going to let them do it without a die roll, you should do the die roll last. Yeah. If you're not, if the die roll is going to happen either way and then there might be some influence on the die roll in some way in your game, I say do it first, partially because of the fact that let's say you have a game where you can get a huge bonus if you describe the thing but you still have to roll in a natural one is going to fail you should know it's a natural one so the player doesn't waste the time to describe all those cool things they're going to do if you weren't going to give them the freebie for doing all those smart clever things that probably should have worked i love to re reward the smart ingenious player yeah that's patient takes their time figures things out 
And but but then I what I do is I throw things in to make it take time so that I can do more random monster rolls. So then it's a question <laughs> of see, so I'm they're gaming me, but I'm gaming them back. And then are they countermeasuring my game? So that's what we do at the table, right? So I want to make them do things that take time so I can do more random monster rolls and try to catch them. And they're trying to do things quickly. And so then, you know, that's an interesting dynamic at the table. So you use like a carrot where you're like, well, there could be extra loot, but you have look to look at this. move look at all these bodies. It'll take, you know, probably 10 minutes to do that mm -hmm. if you want to see if there's a loot. That's right. That's exactly right. I'll take 10 minutes. It's going to be a random monster roll. You sure you want to do it? All right. And then it's weighing their greed with their self-preservation. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly greed right. always wins. Yeah, but that's Dungeons and Dragons. Like it, it's, it's a sword, <laughs> sword. It cuts both ways. Well, there could be blue, but there could be a monster, and so or that it, that looks like a magic item, but it could be cursed. You know, there's always pluses and minuses to everything. And and are you willing to take your chances that night? All right. Well, I gotta go. Okay. But yes, sir. Thanks. Take care, everybody. And uh, yeah. real quick, where can they find your Dragon Slayer? It's all on uh, Drive Through RPG. Uh, just put in Dragon Slayer role playing game or Barrow Maze or Arcaea, and you'll mm -hmm. or uh, a High Fell or Dwarf Deep, and you'll find all the stuff right there. There you go. And I'm very easy to reach our Facebook groups. If you want to join them, you're most welcome. Okay. Sounds all good. right. Well, Stephen, I'll say the thing. I guess. All right. Say the thing. Until next time, if you want to battle the zoo. You have to roll for combat. Bye.